um, shortest path searching. Now you've already learned about this uh, with Dijkstra's algorithm in a previous class, but we're going to look at a little bit. We're going to kind of review what Dijkstra's algorithm is about, how it works, and then get into a new problem that's called all pairs shortest path. Um, that's uh, related to this one, but kind of like taking it to the next level, and then we'll think about how that can work. So let's remember Dijkstra's algorithm. Again, I'm going to go through this quickly because it should be reviewed from previous classes, like from data structures. So we have a fringe and we have a visited list. And let's say we're trying to get the shortest path from A to E. So we start by um, putting A in the fringe, our starting thing in the fringe, and everything in the fringe is going to have a distance of how far did it take to get there. So the A is our starting point, so we'd say it has a distance zero. Um, so then what do we do repeatedly is we take the closest thing off of the fringe, mark A as visited, and then we follow the edges, everything going away from A, and add those into the fringe. So, and then I repeat this process. So now there's three things on my fringe. If I were doing a depth first search or a breadth first search, it would just kind of depend on the order of how these things are stored. Like you could visit any of these nodes next. But in Dijkstra's algorithm, it's using a priority queue for the fringe. So it's always going to take the closest one remaining. So here it's definitely going to visit D next. So I'll take this off the fringe and I'll visit that node. Here's what's happening pictorially, but what's up here is what's actually stored by the algorithm that is working. So now we say, okay, well, I've also visited D. And then I check out all the outgoing nodes from D. So there's one to A, but A has already been visited, so we don't bother with that one. Then there's a node from D to C. Now that, an edge from D to C. That edge has length five, but what we store here is C with the total length so far. So it's the length it took to get to D plus that new edge length. So that'll be total distance eight. So that's representing the fact that we could get to C by going A to D to C. Notice that we end up getting some duplicates in the fringe and that's fine because we're only going to um, examine each thing. We're gonna only visit each node once the first time we remove it with the smallest uh, distance. So now we're done with D. And what's next, you can look at the values of what's remaining in the fringe. And again, since this is going to be a min heap, it's going to take the smallest one off, which is B. So we'll get this edge from D to B. So that's the, that's the fastest way to get to B from A. And now we add everything um, from B on. OK, so now next is going to be um, B or C at length six, so I'll take off B, and, and when we do that, we just don't do anything else. So I removed B from the min heap, but then B is already visited, it's already in the visited list, so I don't do anything else with it. And then next I remove C, C has not been visited yet, so I'll add it to the visited list, get that um, edge, notice that this is the direct um, edge from A to C. Okay, um, so now, What's left on my fringe, the, the two competitors are both E's and both at length 7. And that just reflects that the fact that there's two good ways to get from A to E with length 7. You could either go through D or go through C. So now it's just an arbitrary choice depending on how your min heap works. So we could remove this one. Um, and that would correspond to uh, this path the first time they got added. So now E has been visited and there's nothing else to add. And so now if we are really just interested in the shortest path from A to E, we get that. So we get this path from A to D to E. That is the shortest path, A shortest path from A to E. But I should point out that we actually get the shortest paths from A to everywhere else in the whole graph. Um, so what we, what we really get out of this in green is what's called the shortest path tree. Because it's a tree starting at A, where you, if we let this go until every node gets visited, then it gets us the shorted path to, from A um, to every other node. Okay, great. Um, so that's Dijkstra's algorithm. Let's think about what the running time is. What I really have to do is I have to do some work for every edge in the graph. So for every edge, it's potentially adding something new to the fringe. Um, so that's like at inserting something in a heap. Um, the size of the heap is m, so that's going to be something like m log m running time. But now remember, m 
what we talked about last class is that m is always less than n squared at most. So this is really, um, so log m is really like log of n squared, which is 2 log n. So we would rather say things in terms of n. So we usually write this as m times log n. So m is the number of edges, n is the number of nodes, and this is the running time we have for Dijkstra's algorithm. Um, so there's one other variant, and that variant, again, this is something you should have covered in data structures class, so I'm not going to belabor it too much. Um, but it's that we can use a different data structure for the fringe and the visited list, and it kind of plays well with using an adjacency matrix for the graph. It works well when the graph is dense, has a lot of edges in it, um, and we get a slightly different running time. And so what we do in this other variant, so like this is kind of the dense version, or you can think of the adjacency matrix version, is that my fringe, instead of like just adding things into this and it's a min heap, I'm going to make this be a list where for every node I just store what's the shortest path so far that I know how to get there. And so originally these will all be infinities, like I don't know any way to get to those things. And uh, the visit list will still kind of have the same function as before, but we'll also store this as an array and an array of Booleans, like have you visited that spot yet or not? So originally, um, these will all be false, which I'll just say as, as blank. Okay, so how is this algorithm going to work now? It's going to proceed in the same way, but it's just different in terms of how we store things in our fringe and visited list. So let me let me wipe away all that work from before and then see what happens with this kind of a setup. Um, so again, we start with our starting node, we'll, we'll say has distance zero in the fringe. And now we just do the same thing for before. So we, we find the shortest unvisited node in the fringe. So that means we take a linear scan through and check if everything that hasn't been visited which one of it has the shortest length. So that's going to be A. So we visit A. We mark it as visited. So it has now been visited. Um, and then we update all of the neighbors of A potentially. So we haven't visited those yet, but we updated their distances in the fringe matrix. And so now we proceed. So we are again are going to check for all of the nodes that haven't been visited yet. So like B, C, D, E, we check their current distances in the fringe and take the smallest one. So right now D fits that criteria. So we'll visit D next. Notice that this is proceeding the same exact way as the other Dijkstra's algorithm. It's just using the data structure differently. So now we mark D as being visited. So this is basically just a Boolean that gets set to true. And we update all the neighbors of D. So for A, that's already been visited. We don't need to update it. For C, what are we looking at? Is we're looking at 3 plus 5. And so we only update this if the new distance is, is smaller. So for D to C, that would give us a total distance of 8. 8 is not smaller than 6, so we're not going to change that entry. Okay, D to E gives us a total distance of 3 plus 4, which is 7. 7 is smaller than infinity, so we're going to update that to 7. And then D to B now has a total distance of 5. 5 is less than 6, so we'll update this to 5. Okay, so what we're doing for updates now is instead of just throwing new things into the fringe, we're looking at the current values that are in that fringe array and potentially making them smaller if the new um, way that we found can be faster. Okay, and then this is going to proceed as, as you expect. So B will get visited next. We'll mark B as visited. Um, that corresponds to this path right here. And it turns out from B, we don't need to do any updates because the, the two other edges from B don't make anything smaller in the fringe. So C would be visited next um, at distance 6, like from A. Uh, and so C would be visited next. And that also doesn't, do, doesn't make any updates because the new path from A to C to E also has length 7. And so then E would be visited last, uh, maybe like this the same like we saw before. So it works the same way in terms of the picture, but the running time is different. So what's the runtime going to be with this version? 
if you think about it, what do I have to do at every step along the way is I have to kind of scan through the fringe to see which is the next thing to be updated. And then I have to look through all the neighbors of that one and potentially at, you know, calculate it and update in this fringe. So it's kind of like n steps where I have to visit n nodes and each one of them costs n time where I have to scan through that fringe. So the runtime is just big O of n squared. So if you compare to the previous um, for sparse graphs, it was uh, m log n. What you can see is that if m is small, so if m is closer to n, like if we have a sparse graph, then this one's going to be faster. If m is large, so if most of the edges actually exist, then this n squared would be a little bit better. Um, and so this dense version, like using arrays, this is what we're going to kind of build off of um, for the next thing that we look at. So it's important to make sure that you understand this way of doing Dijkstra's algorithm that has a runtime of n squared. So now the new problem that I said we'll talk about today is called all pairs shortest paths. Um, and so it's just you're given a graph. You want to find the shortest path from any point to any other point. So what did Dijkstra's algorithm give us? It gives us the shortest path from a certain starting vertex to every other vertex, but it doesn't give us the shortest path between them, right? So there's nothing here that allows me to recover the fact that the shortest path from E to C is this direct edge with length one. Um, so th th that, that information is just simply missing from what I've stored so far. And so the all pair shortest paths problem is actually really useful if you think about some of the applications we talked about in the last video, like um, calculating the shortest distance for, for driving directions. One of the things that definitely happens um, is a lot of pre-computation to figure out what's the generally shortest way from like this part of the country to that part of the country. And that turns out to be like an all pair shortest paths problem. There's also, um, so we can think of like GPS routing, is important here. Also, um, some networking problems. So I might want to say I have a bunch of things that are connected in a network, and I want to like quickly be able to say what's the way that I should send this traffic. So one way that you can do this is just run Dijkstra's algorithm n times. So the cost of that is going to be n times Dijkstra. And Dijkstra is, of course, hard to spell. Um, so as we saw, with the sparse graph and adjacency list representation, that's going to be m log n times another n. So that'll be n m log n time. And with the dense graph or using adjacency matrix, so kind of the second version of Dijkstra's algorithm we just looked at, that's going to be n times n squared. So it's just n, n cubed total. And again, which one of these is better depends on how large M is. Um, but this is kind of the option that we're going to go from. So this is what this is saying is that if I want to find the shortest way to get from any point to any other point, I can just run Dijkstra's algorithm starting separately at each point in the graph. And then that tells me eventually uh, all the answers that I needed to know. I can kind of collect all that information at the end. But there is another way of doing this. And it's a dynamic programming way. So that's one of the reasons why I'm starting out this unit on graphs of talking about this is because it's connecting back to what we were just talking about in the previous unit with dynamic programming. So this is what's called the floyd warshall algorithm. And we'll look at an example of this in a second. Um, so before we get into the details of the pseudocode, what I want to point out of what's wonderful about this is the structure of it in terms of code. It's just three nested for loops. It's three nested for loops with a... 2D array being updated in the middle of it. Um, and so we'll see that this, this version is like pretty simple um, and can be fairly effective in terms of finding all the shortest path lengths um, all at once. And the idea is that we are going to update like the, the intermediate vertex. So we're going to start with um, our normal adjacency matrix, so that's what AM is here. This is the adjacency matrix representing the original graph. And then 
what we're going to do in terms of programming this is um, keep allowing you to take like another stopover point in terms of uh, getting the getting the overall path. So let me see what we're talking about here. So we start out with this example graph. We're going to start out by filling it in with the original adjacency matrix. So um, remember that that means I'm going to have all zeros along the diagonals because any node to itself is a distance of zero. And then I have to fill in all these edges. And one way I can check myself is I count um, nine edges in this graph. So there should be nine numbers filled in above the diagonal. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, eight, nine. So that's good. And then all the rest will be infinities. So what we have here is kind of like the direct paths, right? Just the direct edges um, that come from the adjacency matrix. So now what I'm going to do with the floyd warshaw algorithm is allow every possible um, node to be a stopover point. So first I'm going to say, what if, what if A was a possible connecting stopover point? And ask, what could get shorter if node A can be a stopover point? So what that's asking is, for example, like you can see that one path that could be affected here is C to F. So what that's saying is that I have my current path from C to F with S length 4. So that's kind of this spot right here. And now when I'm considering A as a stopover point, I have another option, which is the path from C to A plus the path from A to F. So what I'm doing is I'm comparing this 1 plus 6, comparing that to 4. And in this case, 4 is already smaller than 1 plus 6. So that's not going to change at all. And so I'm doing that same kind of computation for every um, spot in the graph. So I'm also looking at things that don't really help and, and, and don't have any chance at helping, like E to C currently is length 5. And so we're saying, oh, well, we could go E to A first. That has infinity length. And then A to C at length 1. And we're saying, is infinity plus 1, is that a better path than 5? Well, no, it's not. Infinity plus 1 is, is infinity. That's more than 5. So that's not going to change. In fact, nothing gets better from taking A as a stopover point. But that's the first um, outer iteration of this algorithm. And then we just keep going and we replace A with the next node and the next node. So next we'll say, what if B can be a stopover point? So forget about A. What if node B up here can be a stopover point? Does that make anything better? And you should recognize that it will. And so what are we doing here is we're going over every entry of the graph and we're saying this existing path that I have, could it be faster if I stop at B? So A to A is not going to get any faster. It's already zero. Nothing with B is going to get any faster. But what about A to C? So it's saying I could go A to C directly, but I could also go A to B and then B to C. So you see this pattern. Uh, in this case, it's not helped because infinity plus one is um, more than one. So that's not any good. Um, what about A to D? Well, that's not going to help because there's no path from B to D. What about A to E? Um, well, that would be like going from B to E and then E to and then, sorry, um, I got to track this, from, from A to B, and then from B to E, so that would be like infinity plus 1 again, that's not going to be very good. Okay, so we don't end up updating anything in that first row, we're not going to update anything in the second row, because that's all already with B. Um, what about in the third row? So it's saying, because anything changed with, with C. So what does that mean? It's like, thinking about this entry here, this is C to A, it's saying, could I go C to B, and then from B to A. Well, no, here it's one plus infinity again. Most of these are not gonna get updated. Um, so then we can think about like C to D. C to D, and I'm comparing that, what if I went C to B and then B to D? So you should recognize it's always like this pattern of the entry that we're trying to update and then something in the same row and something in the same column and comparing them. So this is again, one plus infinity, it's not gonna help. Uh, one of these should help at least. Yeah, here we go. So C to E, 
I'm saying I could also go C to B and then B to E. And look, oh, there we go. Now that's something finally that gets an improvement because 1 plus 1 is less than 5. In terms of the picture, it's saying that um, if I want to go from C to E, if I stop over at B, it gets me a shorter distance because it's only distance 2 now instead of 5 what it was before. So now I will update this 5 to make it be a 2. And I think this 4 is also going to get updated to 3. Do you see why? It's because it's the C to B plus the B to F. 1 plus 2 is less than 4, so that gets updated to 3. And we would proceed like that for the rest of the graph and for the rest of the stopover points. It seems, so like many dynamic programming algorithms, it seems super tedious and slow and dumb when we do it by hand. The reason is that most of these updates don't happen. Um, so usually most updates won't change it. But it, it's, I think, a really good example of something where this for loop, so what are we really doing is we're just going through the entries of the graph, and this k is like the stopover point um, that we're considering. And so as you do this, it's pretty tedious to do by hand, but what does it come out to be? Well, we can analyze it extremely easily because we have three nested for loops. They're all n time. So that total is going to be just big theta of n cubed. And um, more importantly, it's going to be really, really efficient in practice because we have a single table. We don't have any complicated data structures. Um, we have extremely simple code with just three nested for loops and one step in the middle of them. Um, and so it's like, again, kind of following along the story of dynamic programming that we've seen many times. We get the same asymptotic running time, but it's like a way simpler algorithm, harder to come up with, more annoying and tedious to do by hand, quite honestly, um, with the same runtime as the like adjacency matrix version of running repeated dystras. But I promise you that, um, you know, seven days a week, the Floyd Warshall version is going to be more efficient just because it's this tightly nested for loops. It's kind of the compiler is uh, the compiler and the processor are designed to very efficiently optimize code like this, um, much more than like having combinations of data structures and running multiple things. Um, and so that's the that's the idea of the Floyd Warshall algorithm uses an adjacency matrix, and it makes all these updates. We didn't totally finish it for this example, but it, it makes all these updates by considering, in turn, each of the possible um, vertices as a stopover point. When it gets to the end, it's considered all of the possible vertices as a stopover point, and therefore, it's going to have the shortest paths um, between everything. So that's the Floyd Warshall algorithm. It's another example of dynamic programming. You can tell since it has two people's names that it's actually used in practice quite a bit. Um, and that's the main point that I wanted to talk about today, reviewing Dijkstra's, introducing Floyd Warshall's algorithm, and a nice example of dynamic programming. Next class, we'll see how this uh, surprisingly connects back to something else that we talked about two units ago to be able to do this just a little bit faster than n cubed. All right, see you then.